Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all for coming today. It is my pleasure to introduce Mark Shuttleworth, a man who needs no introduction, the founder of the Ubuntu Linux Project, and he has graciously offered to come in and give us a little bit of a talk on the project. So here's Mark. Thank you very much, Leslie. Thank you uh, again for everything that you've done to uh, make our landing over here and our crazy operation uh, go smoothly. It's, uh, it's, this is an absolutely phenomenal environment for us to be host, hosting a distro summit because we can kind of get everybody together in the middle and then we can have all of these breakout sessions, which is kind of the way we get organized. So I can talk about, I can talk about a bunch of different things, take a bunch of different angles. So the first thing I guess I should, should, should ask is what, what kind of angle are you guys interested in? Are you interested more in the, the technical side of how we organize ourselves and how we plan the distro and build the distro and what, what, what all of that infrastructure looks like? Are you interested more in the social side, how, we, how our community is structured? Can you give me some sort of some sort of indication as to what angle you want me to take? What angle you want me to take? Don't want that. Don't want that. Okay. So I'll do like a general overview. But if, there, if you have any any specific questions or anything at any stage, just uh, just stop me and then I'll uh, the big picture vision is Ubuntu is Linux for human beings. The idea of, of doing what two and a half years ago seemed kind of impossible, taking taking Linux all of the the, the, in all of its gory sort of details and pulling it together in a way that, uh, that feels elegant and right in, in a desktop kind of environment. Um, and that kind of core idea drives everything we do to the extent that we go into servers as well. We, we want to bring that same kind of feel to, uh, to everything we do um, to the extent that the project is, is, uh, is, is sort of mushrooming and turning into a, from a single distro into a family of distributions, we try always to bring that same kind of ethos to, um, to the project. It's very much something that for people to use. Um, it's something that we, we hope um, exceptional technical people will be excited by, but primarily we want it to be something that those exceptional people will be excited to give to their friends, give to their family, give to their grandparents, and, uh, and, uh, and sort of use it, live with it, love with it. So I think of it as delivering the promise of free software. When, when Richard Stallman and others kind of articulated um, this free software idea, um, it became a technical phenomenon. But I think it goes much further than that. And what we really want to do is deliver what I think is the real promise of, uh, of free software. And that is um, fundamentally new economics and a new kind of culture, a new way of producing um, software. And so with Ubuntu, the, the economics are fundamentally different. We're, this is not Red Hat or Novell. Um, we don't assert any kind of proprietary control over the binary bits that we produce. We encourage people to take those and do what they want with them. And we encourage them to take the source bits and do what they want with them too. So that drives a lot of our, lot, that drives a lot of our thinking. We don't include anything in the distro which, um, which would sort of interfere with that. So we are free software applications only by default. Uh, we do compromise on the hardware side, so we do include some proprietary drivers to enable Wi-Fi, graphics, and, uh, and, and, and other aspects of the hardware. But um, we keep the platform something that can be widely distributed and redistributed free of charge and, uh, and preserve the right to change it as well. Um, that free platform includes things that other Linux distros would charge you for, which is uh, security updates, patches, notifications of change, uh, change items, security fixes, and so on. Um, and then on top of that, we layer a, a sort of a commercial um, uh, service offering of uh, commercial support and professional services So to what is a, a large and rapidly growing um, base of users. And then from a cultural point of view, we go to a lot of, a lot of uh, to great lengths to, to, to make this a community-driven Project. So the, the, the ultimate deciding body in Ubuntu is a community body called the Community Council. And then there's a, there's a, a technical group. Um, and then there are other sort of social governance structures that look after other aspects of our broader community. Um, and Canonical, which is the company that really underwrites a lot of Ubuntu's development, although more and more there are other companies contributing as well. But Canonical doesn't, um, um, and I hope in the long run, Canonical will take only a, a modest stake effectively in each of those structures of governance. There are people in every significant structure of governance who don't work for, uh, for Canonical, and I see that as healthy, and, and, and we, we really encourage that. 
Another thing is that uh, the, the platform is very transparent, um, partly because we all work um, from home, um, or most of us work from home. We're kind of forced to use public forums for all of the discussions and conversations. Um, that has some slightly weird consequences as a company. We, we realized that in the whole of last year, I think we had about one hour when we had the company in a room with the doors closed. And I mean, the company as in every employee. Um, and, uh, and that was it. There's very, very little time and opportunity as a, as a company that is, that is kind of excluded, from which our, the Ubuntu community are, are excluded. Next week, we have an all-hands company conference down in downtown San Fran. And that'll be the longest time that we've actually tried to get everybody together um, in, uh, in, in one place. Um, so that really, I think, has helped with the, with the, with the development of the, uh, of the community because people feel that they can actually get in and see the sausage getting made, right? It's ugly. Like building a distro is a messy, messy, nasty process, right? There are, there are ugly compromises that you want to fix in the next release, but we're very strict about our release schedule. So, so things that, you know, decisions get made very quickly, but they get made openly. And, uh, and in almost every decision, there is uh, there's community input. So what, what should people get from, uh, from Ubuntu? Genuine freedom and flexibility. Um, uh, zero licensing fees. We're absolutely committed to, to doing this without introducing any kind of licensing fees. Um, certification. Ultimately, we, we hope that Ubuntu will be just as widely certified and supported both by ISVs and by the hardware crowd as, uh, as uh, Red Hat, Novell, in, in any other commercial OS. So all those other things that, uh, that you would expect from a, from a robust commercial platform. Um, but with collaboration really being um, at, the center, at the centerpiece. So here at this, at this meeting, it's phenomenal. We have representatives of, I can count at least six major tech companies that have come through here. They all have things that they want to get done, things they want to see happen in Ubuntu. And that's a trend that we're encouraging and that's starting to, to, to snowball. It's a forum, really, where people come together and say, well, geez, for my ideal OS, I would like to have this, 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 and this. And I can contribute these pieces. And let me see if there's, if there's interest in the community and from Canonical and elsewhere in, in seeing that same stuff happen. And uh, so to, to the extent that we can reduce um, the duplication of effort and so on, then, uh, then, then that's a good thing. Um, this is what we try to offer users, and um, this, this sort of guiding philosophy um, started really, it was one of the major reasons why we chose GNOME as our, as, as our initial platform, although there are now versions of Ubuntu, there's Kubuntu and uh, Xubuntu that support the other major desktop environments. But uh, simplicity, ease of use, sort of a commitment to making things feel like they just work in a very smooth, rounded kind of way, um, that is sort of our, our guiding um, our guiding vision. We spend a lot of time, for example, looking through the forums to see what people are trying to fix in their systems, right? How to's that, that throw up queries that people throw up. How do I get this done? How do I get that done? And that, that guides our, our, our thinking as to what we need to do in the next release um, to, to, to make it a more polished um, uh, system that really more sort of expresses what people want out of their platform. We have this very, very strict six monthly release schedule um, which I think until Ubuntu came along, nobody thought could be done, but now pretty much everybody else is doing it as well. Um, that's really helped by GNOME's um, commitment to that. And we're trying to, because we have the whole distro coming out now in this sort of six monthly pulse, we're trying to encourage other upstreams to adopt the same sort of view of life. Um, one of the interesting insights there is that we realized that Setting a, setting a feature-based release schedule was very tricky because 99% of the features in the platform are not things we control. So, uh, so we just recognized that, that, that our job was to sort of impose a broader community process on the polishing and shaping of these regular releases. And upstreams will feed us what they will. And uh, we, our job is just to integrate that, the best, the best of the state of the art, um, and, uh, and then push that out the door in a, in a form that people can use and uh, depend on. Um, we, we took a, an unusual decision early on to ship, by default, only one application for each major use case. So one of the, one of the amazing things about free software is there are you know, there's 10 IRC or, or instant messaging clients, and there's three or four browsers, all of which are very good. There's a couple of ways to, to do spreadsheets in, uh, in the free software world. And uh, we, we recognize that all of those are important. So we make them available through our network repositories with varying levels of sort of support and accessibility. But uh, we try to ship just one. 
primary platform. And one of the major reasons to do that is so that users can more easily help each other. And I've seen conversations where you've got two Linux users talking to each other saying, oh, I'm trying to get my browser to do this. And it takes a while before they realize they're talking about completely different browsers. And uh, so we try to eliminate that kind of effect by, by giving people just a, a sort of very clear, obvious way to get something typical done. Um, but we don't, we don't, we learned very quickly that we, we needed to make the rest of that enormous universe of, uh, of free software available as well. So we, we have all of the repositories, everything that you would find in Debian, and a bunch of other packages that haven't yet made it into Debian. Those are, are all accessible and available in Ubuntu. And we have a huge community that's grown up, phenomenal community that's grown up, just effectively tending to, uh, to all of that stuff. Um, and then community really is sort of at the essence of it from, from a user perspective. Users, we encourage end users actually to get involved in the community at any number of different levels. And that's, um, that's been very successful. Uh, there's also a business side to that. So we have a series of partnership programs. Um, a focus for us now is, is pre-installation and uh, the sort of the OEMs and system builders. That's not, that's not of huge interest here in the States or in Europe because the economics don't really work out. It doesn't really work out for Dell to offer you know, end users, end customers, consumer customers in the US Linux on the desktop just because their margins are so tight that one guy who thinks he was getting a cheap Windows deal and ends up getting a Linux deal and gets confused and starts you know, complaining and filing support requests, that guy blows away the margins on 10 other computers. So it, uh, it, it, it just doesn't work out. But in, in many other parts of the world, it is starting to be uh, you know, economically interesting for people to offer computers with Linux pre-installed. So our job is to go and find those places and make sure that those guys get a computer that's, that's so functional out of the box that they're not tempted to go and, and install a pirated copy of Windows and, uh, and, uh, and replace their, their very excellent Linux with that. Um, this is kind of an overview of the things that Canonical does. Um, we have a global support team led by Jeff. Where's Jeff? Jeff, somewhere in the house, um, out, of, uh, out of Montreal. And so that operation is growing there. They now offer 24 by 7 support for Ubuntu on servers out of, uh, out of Montreal. Um, uh, we have, uh, we have a, a sort of a, a management product under development where the idea is that you'll be able to keep track of multiple machines. Uh, possibly for multiple customers that you manage that are all running Ubuntu, and so you can do all the sort of uh, Nagios-style web-based uh, management and monitoring that you'd like. Um, uh, we do quite a bit of work with people who want to take Ubuntu and then make it different. Um, it, being free software, they could do that for themselves, but in many cases, they choose to work with us just because they think um, uh, we might be able to do it more cost-effectively because we know right out the box how best to go about getting something done. And also because sometimes they want those changes to have a good chance of landing in the core distro itself. And if we do it, then we're more likely to like the way that it was done and, uh, and bring it in. And then these are what I think are our most important relationships, which is with uh, the free software community itself. It's, I think there's an enormous temptation as a distro to think that, that you're the most important cog in this free software sort of machine, but the reality is the distro's best, best job is to kind of get out of the way and make it possible for the guys who write Apache or the guys who write Firefox or the guys who write OpenOffice to have their stuff land on the user's desktop in the way that they think it actually should best be used. So to the extent that, uh, to the extent that we can, we, we try to maintain the best possible uh, line of communication with, uh, with upstreams. I, it's, I can't tell you how many times I've sort of been working with distros and you see a distro maintainer, you know, uh, sort of fobbing off the guys who actually write the software um, because the distro maintainer does have this kind of unique ability just to push that software out to the user and, and we want to sort of see things slightly differently. Um, so I think we're the first distro really to say we would ship the latest version and not try and make huge amounts of changes to, to those versions. To the extent that we do make changes then, those patches are more immediately accessible and useful to upstreams. So the upstreams hate receiving wonderful, huge patches that do amazing things based on a version that's 18 months old because they inevitably then can't integrate that directly into their, uh, into their trunk. And we try and, try and stay as close to, uh, to um, the code that upstream is looking at every day um, as possible. Uh, we also try and work well with other distros. The obvious one is Debian. Debian is, you know, we say Debian is our rock. 
Um, that's a contentious relationship. And, uh, and I suspect it always will be a contentious relationship just because Debian is an enormous organization of sort of very strong individuals. So uh, all of whom have a complete spectrum of opinions. But we do find that, that, that we've learned how to, how to um, make the changes that we make available to Debian maintainers so that if they want to collaborate, it's easy for them to collaborate. And we try and, we try and do that. We publish, every time we upload a package that has changed, we both publish those changes on the web and email the changes to, uh, to, the, to the Debian package management system. And we find that some percentage of maintainers take those and integrate them. Uh, some engage in good conversations with us as to what the patch is about. Others drop it on the floor and you know, complain that we're spamming them. Um, and, and we just sort of learn how to turn it off for those guys. Um, but I'd like to extend that further. I think there's, there's really good work that happens in all of the distros, right? I'd like to figure out how we could work more closely with Gentoo, just because they, have, you know, they, 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 they solve certain kinds of problems and they attract certain kinds of people. And they do, there's some aspects of that distribution that I think are really good. And so I'd like us to be able to have a very effective conversation with them for the things that we, you know, that we, that we have in common. Same goes for Red Hat, same goes for SUSE. Um, and potentially also for the BSDs. So I see this whole sort of free software ecosystem as, 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 as something that we need to figure out in each case how to collaborate with effectively. Um, okay. So this collaboration problem is one that we, we think about a lot. And uh, we realized early on that for our purposes, we we're going to need to NIH a bunch of infrastructure. And so we decided to NIH it in a way that it would, it would be useful for other people as well. And so that's what launchpad.net is all about. Um, it's our bug tracker. It's our translation infrastructure. It's our, um, it runs this meeting. So it tells us what we're trying to do in a particular, I shouldn't wave this around. It's going to be <laughs> launching. Um, if I do, there's a prize for whoever it hits. Um, <laughs> So Launchpad is, is, is how we know what we're going to do or what we're doing at any, at, at any given time. And we, we've written it in such a way that, that other projects can use it as well. And so that makes it then correspondingly easier for us to, 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 to work with them. It doesn't necessarily assume the projects are using it. So for example, there's a bug tracker in Launchpad that knows that, ta-da, we're not the only people in the world shipping Apache. And knows that there, there is an, a bug tracker out there, which is where Apache tracks its bugs, and allows us to say, OK, we found a bug in Apache. And yes, Apache Upstream already knows about that. And that's the corresponding bug number. And so then we can kind of decide if we want to do anything about that. But if we don't want to do anything about that, at least what will happen is if Apache says, hey, we did something about this bug, we get notified. And so that makes our lives easier. And hopefully, it also makes Apache's life easier. Over time, we'll, we'll, we'll extend that so that the integration with Apache's bug tracker gets better and better. So if we, you know, if we want to communicate directly with them, we can do so. Um, sort of in, a, in an efficient kind of way. Um, so bugs, translations, feature planning, revision control. Pardon me. One of the problems we have is, you know, we'll, we'll know that there's a patch, or there was a there was a there was a there's a there's a there's a commit somewhere in an upstream's um, tree that fixes a particular issue. And so we want to go find that tree, and then and then grab through the logs to 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 find the relevant point, and then pull the code and, and stick that in a package. Um, but all of our developers then have to learn where all the different CVS trees or SVN trees of all those different groups are. So we, Launchpad also lets, lets us take a sort of a single view of all of those upstreams and have a single like alias for each, uh, for each upstream. And over time, we'll, we'll improve that. Yeah? Do you also share your translations with upstream? Yeah, we do They're at the moment. So it's all import and export of profiles. And so that's, that's easy for them to do. Um, if they're using, if they're using uh, Launchpad to do their translation, which more and more upstreams are, then they instantly see if, if, if an Ubuntu community member translates a particular string in a, in, in a particular language in a particular way, and the next second somebody else you know, loads their, their profile and they've got the same string in it, they'll see that translation. It won't be automatically shoved in. They wouldn't want that. But it, it's uh, then immediately accessible to them. They can say, oh, I just want that. And, uh, and so that's a nice collaboration, point of collaboration. We want to take that further. We want to get it so that if you have the, if you have the ability to translate in Ubuntu, you're an Ubuntu translator and an upstream translator, then you can just translate once and have those translations pushed off automatically. Um, we, uh, we should be able to get it so that we can export those translations, our translations, through the revision control as well, so that upstream's developers can basically just merge the translations straight from, from Launchpad. So over time, we're sort of getting that uh, better and better. But at the moment, the state of the art is if it's been translated anywhere, then you, 
you know, everybody who else who has to translate that same thing benefits. Um, so there are, that's, also, that's also a platform for some commercial services that we offer. There are lots of people out there now who work with free software, but they work in a slightly proprietary way. They, they, they have their own internal view of a piece of free software, but they want to keep track of what's going on in that community. And more often than not, nowadays especially, they're getting smart to the fact that it's not good to hoard indefinitely, right? There are things that are strategic and you want to keep internal, but more, more often than not, that's a rolling window and you want to push code out. Uh, and they're learning that you know if you if you throw a tarball out um, six months or a year later with a very nicely written document that lists a whole bunch of bug numbers that you fixed in that tarball, then uh, you're just going to end up fixing those bugs again because people again can't integrate that. So over time, Launchpad allows us to offer services to those companies, saying, "Here yeah, we can keep track um, for you of of the upstream bugs that you're fixing." and make it so that it's easy for you to publish your patches in a, in a way that's most relevant to, uh, to upstream. Um, we also, Ubuntu has also sort of expanded into a family of collaborating distros. Kubuntu, Edgeubuntu, Xubuntu, Nubuntu, and then others like Guad Linux, Mo Linux, MP, Canopix. Um, and the idea is that these, these guys are all connected, but only as much as they want to be. So, Kubuntu and Ejibuntu and, and Ubuntu all share a hell of a lot. They share exactly the same core, exactly the same kernel, exactly the same everything up to the des desktop layer, but then they're different at that point. So we actually can do all of that collaboration in the same archive. And our goal is over time to be able to collaborate, and there's kind of a hard line at that point between them and the next guys, Guad Linux and Mo Linux, because they're managing their own archives and we don't have any direct connection to them. But over time, we want to make it so that we can do more subtle collaboration even with, 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 with other distros that are, that are managing their own archive. They have different kernels and different um, uh, patches to different pieces of the infrastructure, and we're really interested in the differences. Right? The differences are what are interesting. It's the bit that they've decided is worth investing in, so we want to be able to easily study it, bring, bring it into the, in, into the core distro, or share our changes with them. And uh, Launchpad should let us get all of that done. Um, this is, uh, we, 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 we have this phenomenal community. And the reason I think it's worked out so well is that there's basically something for all, all sorts. We, we encourage the, to people to get involved no matter what their particular um, interest. And we have a, a standardized kind of way of recognizing the fact that people are making a contribution. It doesn't matter what kind of contribution they're making. We, uh, we find a way to, a standardized way to recognize that. If you're putting in your own time and your expertise and, and you're, you're doing good work and you're doing it in, in a way that is sort of, that, that, that fits with the spirit of Ubuntu, then we recognize that in the form of Ubuntu membership. And, uh, and that's true for, uh, for, for people who come from all sorts of different backgrounds. Um, a couple of the, 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 the structures from a development and technical point of view that are, that are most interesting, we have a technical board and that group is responsible now for um, mapping out the, the feature roadmap of the distro, for deciding and arbitrating between um, alternative implementation decisions where we've got sort of contentious proposals. Um, when we're doing something sort of fundamentally new in Ubuntu, usually those proposals will, will come to the technical board and the technical board will discuss it. Technical board is also responsible for signing off on who gets to be a core developer, who gets to upload to what we call main, which is the, the core group. And there's a, another group, um, so then the, the, there's the core development group and then there's, the, uh, then there's what we call the masters of the universe. Those guys um, maintain actually the bulk of the distro. Um, and so that's, a, that's, a, that's all of the stuff that's basically not installed by default, but there's a huge demand for it because the long tail tends to dictate that you know, everybody out there wants to use, um, uh, well, most people want to use a core subset, but then they have their own particular personal interests. And it's a, hella, it's a huge amount of work to, to, to keep those, the, the, that, that long tail of, of applications aligned with what's going on at the core. Because we have this great team focused on the core, they're able to make transitions very quickly. So we always adopt the latest version of GCC. We can do that faster than, than, than Debian traditionally has, faster than other distros traditionally have, because we're very focused on this tight core. But then you can imagine there's version lag between that core and the external environment in terms of like C++ ABIs, Python versions, dependencies, and so on. And so the Motu 
basically take care of all of that. They also do quite a lot of new package development. When new packages are being developed before they've landed in Debian, often they'll land in universe through the, through the Motu. And so that's a place where a lot of learning and development um, gets done, important work gets done. Um, we have a distributed like advocacy framework called Loco Teams, local community teams. And they get very organized. They, they, do, uh, they do local events. They, uh, they do a tremendous amount of uh, education and advocacy um, for us. Uh, the team just put out uh, AGF, um, which went out just a couple of weeks ago. And there are a couple of sort of highlights in that. Um, the th we've been doing some work with the, with the LTSP group. So Jim, is Jim around? They're just over there. Um, so we, LTSP, I think, is really important. It's important for, for two quite distinct sorts of groups for us. One is in our education environments. LTSP is probably the most cost-effective way, cost ways to get desktops into schools. And so for us, we started focusing quite heavily on LTSP as we worked, uh, as we worked in an educational kind of environment. It's also one of the most effective ways to to change the economics of desktop management in corporates. So, uh, so it's important for us for that reason. Anyway, so we started working with LTSP guys about a year ago, and um, um, maybe even longer. And it very quickly became apparent to us that anyone who deploys LTSP has this interesting situation where they're effectively managing two distros. You've got the, the distro on your server, and then separately you have this sort of binary blob which gets shipped out from the server on, on, on over a network during, during the thin client boot process. And that binary blob, if you look into it, is basically a little distro. It's got a kernel, and it's got X, and it's got the core supporting libraries and bits and pieces. And the issue there is then if you have security issues, for example, with X, you end up patching two X servers, and you have to use two different pieces of infrastructure to keep track of that. And so working with the LTSP guys, we, f we figured out it might be possible to um, effectively reuse the distro bits, but in, an, in a thin client kind of way. And so that work has been ongoing. Oliver and, uh, and Matt Zimmerman and other guys kind of got that going. And now more and more the LTSP community is starting to rally around that. And so that engineering is going to be the core of the next major release of LTSP, LTSP 5. And, uh, and Edgy kind of had a, a sneak preview of that. Um, so that's, I think, uh, good stuff. Then uh, we had some, we, we kind of, one of, one of our guys took on the brave task of uh, rewriting process one. And uh, so we were all a bit nervous the day that landed in the, ar in the archive. Um, but it went very smoothly. So where's Scott? Scott? In one of those sessions. Um, so Upstart, which is our new our replacement for init, basically, is uh, designed for a, a, a hot plug world. Um, init, or sysv init, and, and the other things that are traditionally used really are designed for environments where the, where the platform is static, right? You, 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 in traditional days, you compiled your OS for your hardware, and then you weren't really changing your hardware that much because you couldn't move it. And now everything's mobile or ultra-mobile, so, uh, and, and, and hot plugging, right? We've got Bluetooth, we've got USB, we've got PCI hot plug. We live in a hot plug kind of world. And so Upstart is, is designed to, to bring the system up um, in a dynamic kind of way. It, it looks at the hardware events. It looks at hardware initialization. It looks at higher level events in the system and allows us to do dependency-based um, system initialization. It allows us to parallelize a lot of things, right? It allows us to say, OK, whoops, I see we've got network. Let's bring up Apache. It allows us to say, oh, there, I see you've got an HP printer plugged in. I'll bring up the, print, the, the HP printer management daemon. That kind of thing. Traditionally, um, the, the system initialization process has been very linear um, and uh, because of being cautious about race conditions and things like that. So it's been very, very inefficient. If you look at boot charts, a very low CPU utilization for big chunks of, uh, of, of the initialization, system initialization process. So, uh, so that was very, very cool work and, and will get extended in, uh, in the next release to do even more. Dynamic stuff. Interestingly, Apple did the same thing. Apple rewrote um, in it. They did something called LaunchD. So it'll be interesting to see. And that's um, free software, although it hasn't been ported. I don't think it hasn't been ported to Linux yet. It's, it's ported to some of the BSDs. So it'll be interesting to see whether the distros end up adopting LaunchD or Upstart more widely. The next release is what's being planned here. We do this. We have a six-month release cycle. And about a week and a half after the, previous, after the last release, we all come from four corners of the Earth plus community, plus other companies, 
and we map out what the next five months of work is going to be like and what, what kind of features we want to get into the distro. Um, so Feisty Fawn is due in April 2007, and uh, some of the things that I think are approved for, uh, for landing in that are, uh, number one will be uh, desktop effects by default. So I'm sure many of you guys have seen Compass and Metacity, uh, sorry, Compass and uh, Beryl, um, and the, the desktop effects that, that those platforms enable, XGL. We've decided we're going to go with something called AIGLX, which is not XGL, but it's, a, it's an alternative approach um, that's, that's more palatable to the uh, X.org guys. Um, and we will be turning that on by default for systems which have the required hardware, which have all of the necessary infrastructure. So one slightly controversial thing about that is that we will be, we'll, we've always shipped the binary drivers for, uh, for ATI and NVIDIA cards. We may, we may end up turning those on and actually using them by default to, uh, to make this functionality work right out of the box. Um, smooth network roaming. So uh, we want to get it to the point where when you walk into the office, your system knows that that's the printer to use and that this is the network configuration, that's the time server, that's where the proxy is and so on. And when you sort of walk out of the office and you go over to Starbucks, it knows how to use the T-Mobile network over there and so it's familiar with all of these different networks. You configure them once and it's, it, it very organically and very um, um, smoothly lets you roam between those networks in a nice um, efficient way. If you look in the forums, you'll find that, the, the, that that's something that everybody spends, or a lot of people spend time doing, is trying to make multimedia work well. And there are great constraints on what we can ship by default uh, on patent grounds to the whole world. But there are big chunks of the world where those patents don't apply, or they're never filed, or patents like that aren't respected, or aren't, sorry, not aren't respected, aren't legal. <laughs> sensible parts of the world. And uh, so for people from sensible parts of the world, will make it very easy for them to, uh, to, to, to get that functionality switched on by default. Um, telepathy, there's a, there's, a, there's a big push actually being driven by, by companies like Nokia. We have guys from uh, Nokia here um, to, to, to use Linux in communications type products. And so what becomes really important then is knowing who you can communicate and how you can communicate with them. And so uh, telepathy is a, is, a, is a bit of infrastructure which makes that kind of thing possible, keeps track of all the people that you know and where they're at, and, uh, and, and allows you to establish channels of communication to them. So you get really interesting functionality that you can start to be able to, to, to turn on, right? I used to think that this stuff was all about just knowing whether to instant message or VoIP call someone. But there was a, there was a demo yesterday where, where guys were showing, showing off audio editing type software. And they said when the telepathy stuff lands, it'll be easy for them. So this audio editing stuff is designed to basically be like mixing, like a mixing desk. desk. If you're producing a podcast, for example, you can take your, your one recording and then you can, you can mix in some music and all of that kind of stuff. It's very nice, very gnomish, very, very slick, very cool. And they said when the telepathy stuff lands, basically you'll be able to add a musical instrument, which is actually a, a phone call, a SIP phone call. And so, uh, so you'll, you'll, you'll start your podcast thing, and at the relevant time, it'll actually phone out over SIP. It'll call the guy, and you'll be able to record that conversation and mix it in just because to the system, right, that, that, that line of communication is just an audio stream, and it can be, can be handled um, in a very sort of smooth and elegant kind of way. So I think there are things that we're going to be able to demonstrate on the free software desktop, which perhaps people haven't. Um, sort of conceived of yet in, in the proprietary world. And there's this, there's this pattern that I've, that I've observed, that when free software gets to a point of parity with the proprietary alternative, innovation explodes. Now, there's always innovation in, in the free software world, but it's kind of dominated by the desire to reach parity until you hit that point. And then suddenly, you, you sort of, everybody sticks their head over the parapet, and it's just blue sky from there. So Firefox was a classic example. When it got to... When it got to a point of parity and they added the extension mechanism, innovation just blossomed. Because any guy who had a, an interesting idea or twist on the whole browser idea um, could now stand on the shoulders of giants, start from a platform which, which you know, was at parity, and then add his interesting twist. And so I think that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a pattern that we will see with the desktop at large. As the desktop at large reaches this, this point of parity, um, we'll just see tremendous innovation. Uh, printing is getting a lot of attention. It should be possible with, uh, with Feisty to plug and play most printers. There's a lot of work being done at the Free Standards Group, uh, the LSB, um, the, the group that basically sets the LSB standards to make printing very smooth, uh, to make that just rock. 
And then also, we're starting to get to the point now where, where, where there's a lot of demand for formal training and certifications. So in the feisty form sort of uh, cycle, I would expect there to be authorized training materials, a lot of authorized training materials becoming available and training centers and so on. So that ecosystem is starting to grow. Um, so uh, the people can uh, get trained up and certified. And then those others don't matter for this. So that's what we're about. And, uh, I must say it's absolutely incredible for everybody to be here. Everyone keeps saying what a, what a great venue this is. Our, 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 second, uh, our second distro meeting was legendary for its, uh, for its bad food, and everybody keeps contrasting this with uh, this experience <laughs> with that one. I think that's something of an unfair comparison, but uh, it's, uh, this is certainly the most extraordinary environment we've, we've ever been in for this kind of session. So any questions? Any, anything you guys are curious about or want to answer? Yeah. How is Ubuntu doing in Africa? In Africa, it's very popular. There's, uh, Africa's way behind on the te technology adoption curve. Uh, in some ways, uh, interestingly enough, for example, w cell phones are just exploding in Africa. Something like one in nine Africans now has a cell phone, which was unthinkable. When they set the, the sort of poverty alleviation targets f 10, 15 years ago, they said, okay, if we can get to one in 100 people in Africa have, have a telephone by 2005, then uh, we'll be very happy. And they just completely blew that away because of uh, cell phones. So to the extent that Linux is, uh, is, is popular in Africa, Ubuntu is very popular. Um, Any specific parts apart from South Africa? Uh, I've heard of, of big installations in Nigeria and Uganda uh, in particular. And I think some, some localization work in Kenya. But Africa is a bit of a disappointment in terms of, in terms of free software adoption. It just it hasn't. It, uh, when I go to free software sort of events in, in, in Africa, there's, there's a lot of enthusiasm, but they, aren't, they haven't really kind of got the momentum yet. I went to, in Beijing, I was for the edgy release party, I was in Beijing, and there were 450 people showed up. It was kind of daunting, it was unbelievable. I've never seen anything like that. So, where it's hugely popular, Eastern Europe, um, China, Brazil, um, and, uh, and some other countries. Any other questions? Yeah. So Unix has traditionally been very, you know, was a pioneer in, in, in remote, you know, desktops because of, of X network transparency and everything. And a few years ago, then Microsoft just leapfrogged on there. And it, it is all very integrated. You know, you connect to a remote desktop, it resizes to the size of your client window. And you can have multiple of these running and choose which one you're going to connect from a list and so on and so forth. It's all very polished. And I, I, I haven't seen a distribution that makes it as easy to do that sort of stuff in Linux. Is that something in your crosshairs as well? I'd like it to be, and I'll definitely take patches. <laughs> <laughs> So it's, uh, you're absolutely right in that, that there's been this, this sort of winter of discontent in the, in the, in the X environment. I, th I see every indication that that's broken down now with, with uh, X.org basically becoming a new vibrant hub for this kind of development. What, what we don't have yet is a really compelling drive for investment in desktop technologies. I would, I would love to be doing more R&D in the desktop environment. Um, but my kind of my commitment to underwrite Ubuntu goes as far as making sure that we can have the project, that we can grow, it, and we can demonstrate its viability. Once it reaches its own sort of critical mass and sustainability, then I think we could be a focus for that investment. Um, I would like other people, you know, to, to 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 be driving that investment. But at this stage, I don't see any company really pouring resources into the the the, the desktop and uh, um, and and. GUI kinds of, uh, of layers. Most of the real heavy investment is being done, as you understand, on the, on the server side. Yeah. Uh, do you have plans for smooth transitions between distributions for existing Ubuntu users? I mean, Ubuntu versus Debian. I use Debian if I want to install it once, and like, I have all of these new improvements and so on, so forth constantly. But it seems to me like Ubuntu is, is very much like OpenBSD, which you install it like every six months and do heavy install and so on. So forth. is there any any thought on making the transition smoother if you already have a good system? Yeah. yeah. Uh, Mark, please repeat the question. Or... Okay. The the question is is how how can we improve the experience of somebody who wants to instead of running SID from Debian basically instead of staying at head 
who wants to, uh, and, and fixing little things as they come back, who wants to go from one version of Ubuntu to the next version of Ubuntu to the next version of Ubuntu. So we, we do actually formally support the upgrade process. Um, we, we have a, a couple of issues with that. The first is um, we have a lot of people who try to do that upgrade just by changing their, so their app, tetraapsources.list and then doing the upgrade. And um, that on its own won't work because while the packages, packages will get upgraded within their versions, you won't get the same effect as, as literally shifting all the policy type decisions. So for example, when we move from having OpenOffice 1 as the default OpenOffice to OpenOffice 2, if you just did an app sources thing, what you ended up with is both OpenOffice 1 op and OpenOffice 2 because at a package management level, the system doesn't know the policy decision that was basically taken to replace OpenOffice 1 with OpenOffice 2. So we've written an infrastructure called the Update Manager um, and the uh, Upgrade sort of assistant, which um, will pop up and tell you there is a new release available. And if you want to, to go with that release, it not only upgrades the packages, but it also replaces chunks of the system based on the policy decisions that we took during that release cycle. Um, and that, that works pretty well, unless people have gone in and configured their system. And uh, so that's why it's kind of, that, that's, that's, why, that's why it's really important for us to go and study the forums, because it gives us both an idea of the things we need to put into the next release, and also the things we should try and anticipate in the upgrade uh, system. So for example, guys who during, who based on, 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 on DAPA had added um, AIGLX and Compass and all of that kind of stuff, that was a very hard upgrade for them to go from that to edgy. Um, and so we, we're starting to get better and better at sort of detecting those situations and trying to deal with them. Also, we only support a core subset, right? There's only, I don't know, 1,400, 1,500 packages that are in the core subset that we, have, that we support and where we do a lot of testing of, of the upgrade on those. And as people, to the extent that people pull in from that long tail of packages, it, uh, it gets more difficult for us, for us to do. So what really helps, of course, is, is bug reports and, and testing. Uh, and one of, the, one of the challenges for us is that people like the releases so much that they say, oh, well, I'll just wait until the release is out, and then I'll upgrade. And uh, that's a bit late for us to get bug reports at that point. So if you, if you give us just five good bug reports for edgy to feisty, then uh, we will appreciate it greatly and do a good job for you in return. Yeah? Um, on mono. Be careful who you kiss. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe Navelle should have thought of that, huh? Um, so we don't know the terms of the deal yet. You asked the question, ran away. Oh, that's okay. Um, we don't know the terms of the deal yet, so it's unclear. I understand that Microsoft and Novell are frantically rewriting the terms of the deal as they figure out what a minefield they've walked into. Um, I hope somebody loses a foot. <laughs> <laughs> but until we actually fully sort of know, know, know the terms of the deal, we, you know, we can't sort of really comment. I will say that, uh, that I think this is probably only the first move by Microsoft to really start actively countering um, what they see as an emerging threat. Um, free software has had a huge impact on the software industry if you look below the sort of top five companies. Most of the news, most of the headlines are taken up by the, the top five software companies globally. Um, and now we're starting to see free software really starting to impact. Oracle and Microsoft both making major announcements in the last two weeks. On Mono, we're going to ship it. So it's in Edgy, it'll be in Feisty. In your mind, how can we improve hardware support in Linux? That's, that's like one of the top, top issues. I will say that the, the situation is improving dramatically. Um, on the server side of things, you'd be, you'd be pretty crazy to try and sell server kit these days and not have a good Linux support story, right? Um, so, so on that side of things, I think we're, we're, we're in good shape. And what really drove that was market share. When, when, when two things happened, companies started to see that those companies which had a reputation for doing Linux well were selling kit based on that, and those companies which, which didn't have a reputation for that you know, started to just find that their sales calls were that much more difficult. And so they all started to do the right thing there. Um, the, the consumer market is incredible. It's hard to imagine another 
industry which is both physical and so competitive, right? I mean, physical goods generally tend to have a fair amount of margin built into them, but the PC industry is just ruthless and, and tough. So that works. That's a disadvantage to us because if it's going to, you know, cost, everyone knows they've got to write Windows drivers and they budget for that, and the cost of Linux drivers is, is kind of an added overhead. They, they, they don't like to, to have to do that. Um, the flip side to that is that because it's so competitive, once, once everybody's got their prices down to basically exactly the same level, then, 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 then small differences can make the difference between winning and losing a deal. So, for example, if Dell started to say to their laptop suppliers, this modem chip of yours, right, is 25 cents or buck, a buck 50, I don't know what it costs for a modem chip, but this competitor of yours is is exactly the same price, and he's got Linux drivers, so I'm going with him. The moment we have that kind of effect going, then I think you'll start to see much more pervasive um, support. But on the Linux side, we have to, we, we've got some hard problems to solve. You know, this is actually not just up to the hardware vendors to write support for Linux. Linux is not, the, the, the kernel guys don't, I think, appreciate the, 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 the harsh reality of trying to support an OS over time in a changing hardware world. Right? Because they're all living at the tip, to them, hardware support is only getting better. Um, but as somebody who ships at a platform, we're living you know, potentially three months, but also potentially a year and a half behind tip. And now there's a new piece of, now there's a new piece of hardware, and we need to get device drivers integrated. And in this regard, Windows and some of the other Unixes even are, are much better than us, than, 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 than Linux because they, 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 their kernels are amenable to that. They encourage, they make it straightforward to know how you write a de de device driver that will just work on a variety of versions of the kernel. Whereas the, the kernel guys, the Linux kernel guys tend to just say, well, you know, it's not hard. You just take the source, you compile it, and it goes. And, uh, and you know, that's, that's, that's great, but not for, not, 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 not for our situation. So it's kind of a two-pronged thing. One is convince all the hardware manufacturers they need to write drivers. And two is convince the Linux guys they need to create a, a more, manageable framework for hardware companies to, to, to do that. Now, here's an interesting thought for you. There's this massive convergence between the PC world and the ultra-mobile world, right? The, the cell phone type, type markets. And many of those platforms are now starting to run Linux. So to the extent that you want to provide a chip that's going to go into a smartphone and potentially into a laptop, Right? If 20, 30 percent of your laptop or your, your smartphone OS's platform is Linux, then suddenly there's a dramatically increased incentive to do the right thing over there. So we're seeing a lot of companies like Texas Instruments, which used to be very dismissive of Linux, very distant from it, suddenly finding that a large chunk of their core market cares a lot about Linux. And so it reaches a point where a big company starts to say, OK, we, just, we, we have a Linux division, and we send them the product, and they produce the drivers. And that's true. We don't try and anticipate in advance which driver, we, which platforms we're going to need to support. This is just our core set of supported platforms. And we're starting to see that effect kick in, which is great. Anything else? Yeah? Um, you, you probably had some plans and ideas that was going to happen when you started the um, Tell us something unexpected and things how did it not go the way you expected? Oh, <laughs> so I would not have expected to go to Beijing and have 500 kids standing there and asking detailed questions about Ubuntu and how we put it all together and the, and the build process. I would not have expected to have a meeting with the Chinese government minister who says, yes, we're building a reference platform for China and it's Ubuntu with a different name on it. Right? I, <laughs> I, would, I would not have expected... Um, um, I'd not have expected us to be here, right? When, when, we, when we started, we didn't know if the world would care, right, about the things that we, that we, that, that, that we cared about, but we felt strongly enough about them to try. So it's, uh, it's, it's kind of surprising to see. You guys, you might have heard of this thing called Google Trends. Check out, check out Ubuntu on that, and that's been surprising. So that's awesome. So as long as I feel that, that the world is moving to free software and that, that Ubuntu is going to be an important part of that, then it's a great privilege for me to be part of it and to continue to underwrite it. Yeah? So uh, as the world is, well, you're hoping that the world is moving to free software, but at the same time, the world is moving to proprietary web services. So how, how do you see those two colliding? Well, do you guys know any companies that do proprietary web services and use a lot of Linux? <laughs> 
So, <laughs> so, so there are there are some interesting questions there, right? And a lot of those questions are at the heart of the GPLv3 discussion. Um, what is what is how far should those freedoms go? How far should those freedoms be be be? How far should be compulsory to participate? If you if you if you derive from 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 these platforms, is that is that really what you're asking? Yeah. Um, my view on that is that the GPL v2, whether it was deliberate or accidental, ended up being an extraordinarily well balanced document. Right. It it it's interesting when people are not in a position of great power, they sometimes tend to think, you know, more more rationally about about how things should be. And one of the reasons South Africa has done incredibly well over the last 10, 12 years is that the government we have today spent 50 years in a position of no power planning what government should look like. And they did really well in, in building that. So I, think, uh, so I think the GPL v2 really struck a very, very nice balance. Um, I think the v3 process is important. There are, the, the world does change, right? You can't just, just, just sort of assume that, that a document that was good 20 years ago is going to stay good now. I trust the people who are driving that process. I think the FSF have done very well by all of us. I think Eben Moglen and Software Freedom Law Center, I think they're, they're trying to do a very open process. Let's be real. There's a lot of very well-paid lawyers from all sides taking a very active hand in the process. And I hope that ultimately what they produce is something that, that we can all live with. I th ultimately, though, I think guys like Linus Torvalds and others will look at it and say, you know, thumbs up or thumbs down, and it won't do. It won't be bad for the world if people look at it and say, you know, thumbs down. We don't. We, we don't. We don't need that. Perhaps though, the the Microsoft Novell move um, will catalyze people's interests in, in in bringing DRM and patent issues and potentially also web services kind of into the mix more aggressively. Um, I think there is a fundamental difference between the software you expect somebody to run on their platform and the software that you run as a service. So Launchpad is proprietary. And I take a bullet for that every time I talk about it at a free software conference, right? But I absolutely think that there's, there's nothing wrong with the approach we, we, we're doing there. We contribute a lot to the pieces of that infrastructure which we share with everybody else. And uh, so I think that's fine by us. Big waffly answer, no real clarity there. Hey? Yeah. So I think we can both agree that it is a, an excellent platform to, to build upon, and it was designed to be that way. You know, Prodigy back when Brooks Parents was doing that, tried to create a commercial distribution base on that, and, and I, you had much more success building Ubuntu than, than whomsoever came before. I, wanted, I wonder if that is just because you, you picked the right moment to do that when things really coalesce, or if you did anything fundamentally different that, that, that caused that to happen? Well, it's not, Ubuntu is not a commercial distribution. So, um, so, for example, I think Corel and others had, a lot of people had taken a Debian and tried to create something that was kind of proprietary and commercial out of it. And uh, I think those efforts are, are sort of doomed to failure because it's very hard. If, as much as I say our relationship with Debian is contentious, it's one of those situations where we agree on 99.9% .9 of the time and then shout in public about the other 1%, right? And so at least the collaboration is, you know, there, there, it's, it's possible to build personal collaboration relationships there because our guys all think in the same sort of ways and care about the same sort of things as the Debian guys generally. <laughs> so I think we call those autoimmune diseases, right? Um, um, I don't know. I, I hope ultimately that that relation, you know, that, 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 that both Ubuntu and Debian are greatly strengthened over the next, uh, the next uh, couple of years. I think Ubuntu benefits tremendously from Debian. I, I know that there are some people within Debian who think that Debian benefits tremendously from Ubuntu. All right. Well, thanks very much, guys. It's been... Uh, Thank you.